are welcome to spend some time in the fellowship hall. There will be some food. And then after the election, we will have a review of financials. Uh, one of the requirements of a PCUSA church is to have a yearly review of financials. I was thinking about this uh, on the way here, and I'm sure a lot of the mega churches will keep their finance, finances under wraps, you know, because money is a sensitive issue. And I'm not sure if there are many organizations in the world where uh, the person's income is analyzed and looked at, and, but in the church, uh, that's the case. And, and, and partly that is for transparency's sake and accountability. It's the Lord's money, but it's also the money that you give. And, and, and where the money goes, you want to make sure the mission of the church and the money matches up. And so we want to have a very open discussion and review of our situation. Yeah. Next week. Okay, so Andrew's not ready, but so we'll do that next week. So that way we'll save some time. Now that Andrew mentioned it, as I was in prayer, you know, I, for myself and many others, especially the old timers, people who've been here since, I will say, 2006 or so, uh, this, this transition time is one of mixed feelings. You know, it's, it's, it's not easy. For those who are new here, perhaps you won't be feeling it and, and, and you're not expect, expected to feel. But I, I believe for the old timers, there's going to be a process of grieving. I mentioned uh, some of the lessons I learned as a chaplain and, and as a chaplain, when someone dies, that's a real tense time. You're not quite sure how the family will respond because sometimes family members who have been getting along will come to the, uh, the patient's bed and sometimes bad things happen. An argument will ensue. Other times uh, people won't communicate at all. And as a chaplain, uh, I was trained to facilitate certain kinds of discussion. And ideally, when a family gets together and the, and the person who's dying is alert enough, there are five things you want the family members to say to the patient and the patient to the family member. Okay? And you may know this already. And the first thing you want uh, for the people to share is thank you. You know, thank you for your life, for being my mom or being my dad or being my son. The second thing is I'm sorry. You know, going through life, people make mistakes. And that's guaranteed. To err is human. To forgive is divine. And so we say I'm sorry. And number three, I forgive you. Number four is I love you. And number five is goodbye. And and there's some variation of that. You, they don't have to say those exact words, but if all those five elements are said, then the, then the death itself can be a blessing. Uh, when someone dies without these elements communicated, there's usually some regret and guilt associated with that. And although in this case it's a person dying, but this kind of grief process takes place whenever we leave, when parents, when kids go away to college, um, you know, when someone moves away to a different place. I remember maybe about a week ago, I was, you know, John, I said, oh, I'm going to miss Rockville Church, KPCR. And, and this is all she's known, basically. She, uh, she, was, she started attending here before her fourth birthday, uh, 2004 in the spring, and so Serena was two. So for my girls, uh, what they remember about church is here. This sanctuary, the people here, and, and, and so that's, that's a real emotional connection. You know? And in fact, just to rehearse a little bit, uh, this church and the people of the church have been very meaningful in my own life. When we moved to the U.S. at the end of 72, a few years later, 73, 74, uh, one of the folks that befriended my parents were Jennifer's grandparents, Elder Cha and because my father had known Elder Chai as a Marine. He was a well-known, tough Marine. He would beat up everyone, and so everyone knew him. And so when he found out we were here, they took us out to a meal, encouraged us to go to church. We weren't church attenders. You know? 
And so they were one of the first to reach out. And the, uh, and the first church I attended regularly was in 1980. It was this, the parent church of this church, UKPC on Wilson Lane. And Andrew's dad was my youth pastor. And I remember when Andrew was a baby and others, uh, that members here. So in 1980, as an eighth grader, I, that was the first time going to church regularly. And then in 1994, between uh, Gordon Conway and Yale Divinity School, I had to do an externship, and I still remember, it's, it's as if it happened yesterday at Twinburg, and Yusung's there, Caroline's there, Diana's there, the old timers were there, you know, and I did my summer externship, internship, and I remember uh, the Yoons coming in, and their Mazda MVP, one of those, uh, you know, kind of half station wagon minivan, I remember the color, and Little Ruth and Sammy coming out from Knoxville, Tennessee. So they were just moving here, you know, getting, getting ready. And, and so uh, this is all, you know, it's, it's an emotional thing. And, and when it's connected, there's just going to be naturally a lot of different emotions that people will experience. And, and, and the thing to do is allow the emotions, uh, have, have the emotions uh, give the emotions a particular role. But uh, as, a, as a person who prays, you don't want the emotions to dictate what, what's happening. And so the emotions are good, but nevertheless, we're not slave to emotions. You know, we acknowledge the sadness, maybe the anxiety, maybe the hope. And so we need to be true. Right? The weight of these sad times we must obey. Uh, we, we say what we feel and not what we ought to say. King Lear. And so when, when certain things are important, we ought to say what we feel, not we, what, what we ought to say. And, and again, I think depending on when you came to the church, the feelings associated with the church would be various. Okay. And, and so, especially for old timers, you know, this is going to be a difficult time. It's not an emotionally simple, easy time. And so let's just keep ourselves in prayer. Uh, the Lord is still with us, and the Lord's going to guide us. Uh, what I want us to focus upon is during this transition uh, to focus on one thing. And that one thing is a person. And so if you have your Bibles, if you could turn to Isaiah 42, we'll read verses 1 through 17, but the key section is really verses 1 through 4. But the reading of the entire passage would be helpful. Uh, this is one of four what's called servant songs in the book of Isaiah. Another one occurs in 49, 1 through 6. Another one, 50, 4 to 9, if you're taking notes, 52, 13 to 53, 12. And, and, and in all these, the servant, the figure of the servant is the Messiah. In certain passages, like in 49, the Messiah is called Israel, the true Israel. And in the 52 passage, the Messiah is the high priest. Okay. And, and, and so this is one of these prophetic passages in Isaiah that tells us about the Messiah, Jesus, Yeshua. And it begins thus. Here is my servant whom I uphold, my chosen one in whom I delight. I will put my spirit on him and he will bring justice to the nations. He will not shout or cry out or raise his voice in the streets. A bruised reed he will not break, and a smoldering wick he will not snuff out. In faithfulness he will bring forth justice. He will not falter or be discouraged till he establishes justice on earth. In his teaching the islands will put their hope. This is what God the Lord says, the creator of the heavens, who stretches them out, who spreads out the earth with all that springs from it who gives breath to its people and life to those who walk on it. I, the Lord, have called you in righteousness. I will take hold of your hand. I will keep you and make you to be a covenant for the people and a life for the Gentiles, to open eyes that are blind, to free captives from prison, and to release from the dungeon those who sit in darkness. I am the Lord. That is my name. I will not yield my glory to another or my praise to idols. See, the formal things have taken place. A new things I declare before they spring into being, I announce them to you. Sing to the Lord a new song. 
his praise from the ends of the earth. You who go down to the sea and all that is in it, you islands and all who live in them. Let the wilderness and its towns raise their voices. Let the set- settlements from Kedar li- lives, lives rejoice. Let the people of Selah sing for joy. Let them shout from the mountaintops. Let them give glory to the Lord and proclaim his praise in the islands. The Lord will march out like a champion. Like a warrior, he will stir up his zeal. With a shout, he will raise the battle cry and will triumph over his enemies. For a long time, I have kept silent. I have been quiet and held myself back. But now, like a woman in childbirth, I cry out, I gasp and pant. I will lay waste the mountains and hills and dry up all the vegetation. I will turn rivers into islands and dry up the pools. I will lead the blind by ways they have not known. Along unfamiliar paths, I will guide them. I will turn the darkness into light before them and make the rough places smooth. These are the things I will do. I will not forsake them. But those who trust in idols, who say to images, you are our gods, will be turned back in utter shame. Much like all of Isaiah, very powerful voice, prophetic voice, both beautiful and powerful and true. And, 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 and the thing, the main focus of this passage happens early. Here is my servant. Uh, the word here in Hebrew is hen, and in the older translation, it's translated not here, but behold. Behold my servant. And the word for my servant, Abdi, in the ancient Near East, it's a royal term. And so when we hear the English word servant, we may think of someone who cleans our house, someone who may work at the restaurant. But in the context of the ancient Near East and the royal courts, my servant is my trusted envoy, my confidential representative, my ambassador. Here, behold, my servant. And so it, it goes to describe who, who this servant is. He will bring about justice. It describes his character. And this very passage, 1 through 4, is cited, is quoted in Matthew 12, 18 through 21. It's through him God will make his covenant. It's through him that the light of God's salvation will shine. So he is the central figure. You have two figures here, the servant and God the Father. And so you, you get that uh, to, to focus uh, verses 1 through 4 on the servant and the fo- five and following on God the Father, uh, God the Lord. Okay. But nevertheless, for our sake, we're going to focus on Jesus, the servant. You know, whenever we go through transition, there's things to focus on, okay, naturally speaking. We could f- focus on possibilities. All, the, all these choices start with the letter P. Possibilities. Whenever there's a transition, possibilities of jobs, location, possibilities of marriage partner, if if you're lucky to choose, possibilities of churches, you know, that's the first thing. If you have choices, you look at possibilities. The second thing you look at are prospects, and you grade them. What's the prospect of that job? Well, that pays about 200,000. How about that job? About 70,000. Well, what are your chances of getting that job and so forth? Uh, you, you may look at provisions, money issues. Well, if I take that job, if we relocate, what, what, what's our money situation? You know, if we have kids, uh, should you stay home or should I work? Uh, you know, and so there are things that you look at, obviously, and, and, and people don't, who don't look at these things are not thinking human beings. You, know, you just have to look at it. And then there are people, especially like a church move, people... It's the people that's moving. If, if we say we're going to move and no one joins me, then that's a failure. <laughs> it's the people that's moving. And so the questions we ask with people are, how are they feeling? What are they thinking? Are they ready? And so although the idea may be of the Lord, but if the people aren't ready, they're not going to follow. If Moses said, okay, this is the time and no one leaves Egypt, he'd be the only one, parting the Red Sea by himself, walking in I mean, he'd he'd just be, perhaps in his worst days, that's probably what he had wanted instead of the complaining, you know, mass of people. But the people have to go. This is a people movement, and so we need to consider that. 
And the last you know, thing to look for are potential problems. If X, then what are the problems? If we move, like, what are the potential problems? What, we can't eat food every day? You know, we can't eat Sunday? We got to clean up after our kids? That's a problem. I don't want to clean up. You know, I mean, you know, whatever the problem. And so these are things that any human being, uh, when there's a transition, you just think about. Okay? Now, I know I have some business people here. I remember Suzanne in our MBA course. Goes, what are you doing? I asked him, what are you doing? Goes, I'm doing this SWOT analysis. SWOT, wasn't that a TV show? You know, SWOT. S-W-A-T. No, no, she said, no, it's not SWAT. It's S-W-O-T. And, and so this, and we could do a SWAT, SWAT analysis, a SWAT matrix, right? And this is help from Google, all right? A structured planning method to evaluate strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats involved in a project venture. Okay? The origin of this is obscure. People really don't know, but there was an article written by a Stanford business person a long time ago, and... And I think this is, I'm not sure how often this is used, but it's a way of, you know, weighing. If you are a business and you want to do a new project, you want to analyze before you invest the money and time. You want to sit and calculate. And the Bible even kind of talks that way. Like, before you go to war, sit down and make sure you have the army enough, you know, that you're, you have enough strength to defeat the enemy. We've got to think about how we walk with the Lord. And so God's not opposed to this kind of thinking. Okay? And so we could do a SWOT analysis, strengths. We could list the characteristics of the project that will give us an advantage over others. And if we do this, what are the strengths? Weaknesses, characteristics that place the project at a disadvantage. You know, if we were to relocate the, the center of the, the, the you know, business center to Dallas, what are the weaknesses? For example, opportunities, elements that the project could exploit to its advantage. If we get uh, Tim Tebow to, to, you know, be our spokesperson, what, what, you know, what are the advantages? I mean, what are the opportunities there? Tim Tebow, I mean, he's not that popular now. Joe Flacco. I decided to root for the, uh, the, the Ravens. I, I'm a Marylander. It's, it's my mind grieving over the, the, just the pathetic nature of the Redskins and so on. I'm a Ravens fan. So I enjoy the game last night. Dick LeBeau looks just like Ed Hackett. When you see Dick LeBeau, the d defensive coordinator of the Pittsburgh Steelers, next time you see his face, you will see Ed Hackett. I just want to tell you that. Okay, threats, elements in the environment that could cause trouble for the projects. And so th this is, you know, you know, these four elements together can help you decide whether to move forward or not. Okay? And all these are valuable. But when you're walking with God, there are certain things, a certain analysis that really does not fit. I mean, it doesn't really do justice. And mainly the simple way to say this is that there are too many unknown variables with God. In order to do a SWOT analysis, you need some sense of what will happen. But sometimes when we are working with the Lord, we just don't know enough. That's problem number one. Problem number two is the kind of weight we give to our strengths and weaknesses may not be the same weight that God gives. Okay? I have some examples. Okay, here's some biblical examples. Let's do a SWOT analysis on these things and see how, what the outcome is, okay? I'm going to go through this really quick. You might have noticed I'm talking really fast because I do want to finish in 10 minutes now. The call of Abram. Abram, get up, go. Where? Just listen to me. I'm going to make you some promises. Laura, let's do a SWOT analysis. You're telling me to go someplace where I'm comfortable from where I'm comfortable to a place I don't even know. What's going on here? I mean, I think if we were to analyze, if we were in Abraham's show, I think we would have good reason not to listen to that voice or to listen to God's voice that promises nations and children as just hogwash, like, boy, I better stop drinking this Arab coffee or whatever, you know, what, you know I better get some more sleep. You know, it just doesn't make sense. Moses and Exodus. Moses, I'm going to send you to Egypt, and you're going to bring my people back. Uh, you know, Mo 
you know, Lord, I'm, I'm just one person. And Egypt, by the way, is big and powerful. Uh, the people that I'm going to be working with are slaves. Uh, they have obvious strengths, and we have clear, obvious weaknesses. I don't think that's going to work. How about Joshua and the crossing of the Jordan? Okay, Moses gets out. Now Joshua's turn. Hey, how about the land that you're going to occupy? Oh, we can't do it. Giants in the land. Much bigger people, better organized. They're, they're warfaring people. We cannot overtake them. Okay. How about David and Goliath? Little David, young, with a slingshot. Goliath, a veteran of war, many wars, a huge man who's, who's, who, whose professional job is to kill people. David comes back and says, no can do. This is, look, look I'm only 15. That man is older, and look at him. He's huge. He eats people. Okay, I mean. How about ministry of Jesus and the calling of the disciples? They were just mediocre students. I, I would say they would be, if they, if they took my theology class, I would probably guess that they would get B's, maybe C's. Not particularly bright. You know, mediocre. Like, how in the world, Jesus, are you going to change the world through 12 mediocre people and one is really rotten? You know, like, how about the early church under persecution? Roman empires against them really changed the world through these small house churches hidden away. Really, you're going to change the culture and the Roman Empire. Okay. So in, in almost any one of these stories, if we were to do sort of a humanistic analysis, it, it spells epic failure. All right? <laughs> you just wouldn't even venture out with God, knowing in reality what's at stake, knowing in reality your weaknesses and strengths. Okay? And so uh, walking with God is inherently risky. Okay? It's inherently risky because there is a great percentage of great probability that you may fail. Right? Because, and and th let's be honest, there are some God ordained, and let me put that in quotes, uh, people have done things in the name of God, and they ended up in failure. I've seen marriages where the, the couple, yeah, God told me to marry, and then a few years they're, they're in divorce. Looking back, I, I, I wouldn't say God called them, because God doesn't call people to get divorced. You know, I would say, I think you guys didn't hear the Lord. That's not the person you should have married. And I know the, one of the churches I served in L.A., uh, someone thought like God had told them to buy a building and to do that, and, and it ended up in failure. Looking back, I would say they, they probably didn't hear from the Lord. Okay. And so the issue isn't God setting up for failure. Sometimes we mishear God, and that's why we need to sort things through and be, be prayerful and, uh, you know, and kind of get to the sense. But once you sense that this is the Lord, you, got, you, you have to do something. To not do something is to do something. If God says go and you say, no, I, you know, I, I don't want to, even though I feel like you are calling me, that's deciding not to go. Okay? Okay. It's, as uh, John was saying, it's either zero or one, right? Zero is to stay, one is to go. And, and so, but it's inherently risky. And no matter how much you analyze the possibilities, people, provisions, problems, whatever, even if you, you know, go through that countless times, it just won't give you the peace that you need to make that transition. Unless we focus on the right person, right P. And that's person. It's Jesus. The bottom line with our move, and I'm going to be talking about this in a little more detail next Sunday, is that we believe the Lord is moving us. I mean, he used circumstances, of course. But if God's not part of this, I'm not interested. I'd rather be comfortable. If God's not involved with this, if God hasn't given us a destiny, some vision, then I would rather, I'm a creature of comfort. There, there, there are two people in my house. We are homebodies, me and Serena, all right? Come on, Serena. It's so true. Jonna and, and, and Suzanne overall, they're more active. You know, they could only rest so long and they, get, they want to do something. 
Whereas me and Serena, we just have our room. You just need a few things. You need books, maybe a video game, and we're all set. We don't need to engage people. No, we're happy being who we are. And so if God's not involved with us, I would rather just stay and not, you know, just be comfortable. Because that's what I would like to do. But once God is stirring us, then I have to respond. And ultimately, we're responsible for the Lord. I mean, before the Lord, you know. And so uh, when it comes to God, it's inherently risky. But if it is of God, then the fruit of that call, that response will show itself. And I'm going to go through certain modern movements that started out as just hearing the voice of God. Each time I go to the YRAM base in Kona, I, every single time I say, this is a place of faith. Because when Lauren Cunningham started, they had no money, no plans. They just went by just day by day. So YWAM, the, the largest mission agency, started as a faith movement. And what he had as a young man was, uh, you know, visions of waves of young people being washed ashore, being missionary. And this is a radical idea at that time. If you want to be a missionary back then, you had to get the proper training. You had to be a certain year, you know, a certain age. You, you were think more long term. But here's a radical vision: short term, using high school kids, college kids, evangelism. It was really offensive to traditional missionaries. Even while I was at Wheaton looking at some of the literature, there were a lot of attacks on the YWAM movement. How can young people who don't know the language go and, you know, do something? This is, you know, this is tourism. This is mission tourism. You know, and, and now you have long-term YWAMers. So they, they, they change. And still, strategically speaking, you can do short-term. And many of the young people will come back with the Nawa vision, whether they become full-time missionaries or something else, now they have a heart for the nations. Right? So YWAM, IHOP, Bethel, Iris Ministry. But even non, you know, these well-known, like Calvin College. Okay? Many of us don't know what Calvin College is or Wheaton College. These are small Christian liberal arts school in the Midwest. Calvin College, one, was the place of, uh, an important place for Christian philosophy. This little school out in Grand Rapids produced outstanding scholars, and they're still producing good scholars, who now are changing, you know, sort of the scholarly outlook on Christianity. And you can look at Harvard, Yale, the beginnings of these schools. These were minister schools. You know. So a lot of these places just began with sheer obedience. I think God is doing it, so let's go forward with it. Okay. And so I think that's what we're doing. Laura, I'm not sure, let's say in March when we leave, it's me, my family, and maybe two, three other family, and no one else shows up. And we said, oh, all right. <laughs> let's find a nice white church that accepts Asians. And we go. No, it's inherently risky. But that's part of the fun. Part of the risk, okay, part of the gift of risk is the gift of dependence. Now that it's risky, who are you going to trust? And it's going to be Jesus. All through this process, I would, I would say to every single one, whether you stay here or not, to focus on Jesus. Hebrews 12, 1 through 2, let me read this. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. Let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Let us run with perseverance, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. And that can be applied to us. If Jesus is powerful enough to save us, he's powerful enough to guide us. If he's powerful enough to provide for you as a, as a person in a family, he's powerful enough to provide for the church. And so we need to fix our eyes on him. Okay? And, and, and we have good reason to. 
Because Jesus knows what? Okay. He knows your strengths, but he also knows his strengths. Okay. Uh, he knows our weaknesses, but he also knows that weaknesses can be transformed into his strength. Therefore, when I'm weak, I am strong. There's that amazing paradox, because when I am weak, I depend on the Lord's grace. My strength, my grace is sufficient. Well, he knows the opportunities, both hidden and revealed. And a lot of the opportunities are hidden. You discover it later. Once you say yes, you go, oh, my goodness. I never knew this is what was in store. And I sense that with our move. There are hidden opportunities. Nation, people of different nations coming and getting their bodies healed and their hearts healed. The hope restored. He knows the threats. He knows about the giants. He knows about Pharaoh. Okay. But with the Lord, uh, these threats can be overcome. Okay. So he knows SWAT and more. Jesus knows the future. Okay. He knows uh, all the what's called counterfactuals. You could ask him now. If X, then he knows Y. If not X, then he knows Z. Okay? He knows what the outcomes will be. If you do this, this, this is what's going to happen. If you do this other thing, this is what's going to happen. So he knows the future. The future in the thinking of Jesus is not fuzzy. He knows what the outcomes will be. Okay? So we could trust him. We could fix our eyes on him because he has these knowledge. Knowledge of SWAT and knowledge of the future. Okay. Jesus empowers those who move in obedience. It's not just knowledge, but he's there as Emmanuel. God with us, he empowers us. He gives us favor. He empowers the environment. He shapes the environment. I love miracle stories that has to do with God orchestrating different people at different times, and then boom. So beautiful marriage stories are like that. Job, jobs, you know, people who get incredible jobs. There's this kind of the miracle of God's providence at work. So, he's, he's, so he has power over us, power over the environment. Okay. So we have knowledge, we have power, and Jesus is committed to us. We use the word love. He loves us. Love always trust, right? The beautiful passage in, in the Bible, 1 Corinthians 13. Always perseveres, always trusts, always hopes, always protects. So Jesus is committed to us. Even when we're not committed to him, he's committed to us. And he does not set us up for failure. Why? Because Jesus is committed to God's glory. There's a section here, verse 8. I am the Lord, that is my name. I will not yield my glory to another or my praise to idols. Uh, these are one of the great insight into the actions of God. Why does God do the things he does? The answer, biblically speaking, because he's committed to his glory. We love to say he does it because he loves it, but ultimately he does that to shine his glory. God is so great. He will glorify himself. And so if we, in obedience, follow him and we fail, that does not bring God glory. Okay. He's in it for himself. He wants to glorify himself. Okay. He wants to take a bunch of no-names, and we're all no-names, none of us are famous. The only famous people are by association, you know, Esther's brother. That's about it, I think. Anybody else famous here? Or your friend or family member? Friend doesn't count, family member. Oh, yeah, uh, OAR guy, uh, Jimmy's friend, Richard, right? He's kind of famous, but not like famous, famous. Anybody know Obama or Eddie Vedder? Huh? Remember a bunch of no-names, all right? I'm a no-name for sure. So he's going to take a bunch of no-name and make us famous. Not, not maybe worldwide famous, but famous in the eyes of God. He wants us to be famous because it's through us. God wants to heal 
hearts and lives. And there are lives out there that the Lord wants us to touch. And the lives, I believe, will look different than, look, he loves Asians, but that's not the only group he loves. He loves all kinds of people. Okay. And so he's going to touch lives, right? But in order for us to say yes uh, to this kind of glory, glorious experience, uh, we need to focus on him. We, we need to submit ourselves to Jesus. Luke 9, 35, the voice from heaven, God's voice, God the Father's voice says this. This is my son, my chosen one. Listen to him. Listen to him. And that's what we want to do. During this transition between now and March and, and, and months thereafter, we want to have the, the, the simple discipline of focusing on Jesus and listening to him. Lord, what's on your heart? And confessing, I trust your knowledge, I trust your power, I trust your competence, your wisdom, I trust your love. Okay. And so although different emotions may, you know, rush through, swirl through, we also have this other set of emotion that's really, uh, stem, that stems from fixing our eyes on Jesus. And when we do, peace will come in that transcends all understanding. Quiet joy will come in, anticipating the good that the Lord will do. Okay. And, and, and a wakefulness, you know, when, when people get ready for some sports, you know, uh, competition, there's a good nervousness, butterflies in the stomach. You know. I know Serena was thinking, butterflies in the stomach, the stomach acid would kill the butterfly and digest it. But, you know, metaphorical butterflies in the stomach. There's, there's like, and that gives a sense, sense of like wake, like excitement, like, wow, this is, this is going to be fun. This is going to be a little bit scary. Okay. So I'd like to just close our time in prayer. Okay. And if you don't mind, I'd like to pray for our two sets of people. One is a smaller set of the old timers. Those that know me uh, in 2004 or prior, like I remember when John Shen was born, okay, okay, because his grandfather uh, is was, you know, related to my mom, it goes back a long ways. So I remember John Shen's when he's a baby, Andrew when he was a baby, and so I mean this is, and I think the old timers will have a hard time, naturally so. And Soyoung, I've known for a long time. And Yuzang and Caroline as well. Okay. So if you don't mind, I, I would like to just pray for the old timers and, and ask for peace. Okay. And then the rest of us, that, and it was interesting, in 2004, a whole bunch of people joined us from Montgomery Baptist, later changed to Ebenezer. It might have changed again, but... Hans' family, Charlene, Grace, Linda also came. Yeah, and Jimmy. So, Lord, we pray for, right now, the old-timers, people who've spent all, almost all their life going through this church. And I just ask for peace, your voice, your comfort. I just honor them for their many years of Faithfulness, even when things were difficult, coming to church and being connected to the, the church body. And we honor the, the, the elders and the leaders. I, I just speak a word of blessing to Jennifer's grandmother, Hong Jung Nanim, who, who, who knew me as a nine-year-old 40 years ago. And other elders who knew me for a long time, Lord, and, and their heart is full of love. And so we love them in return. We pray for all those who joined us in, in these various years from 2004 all the way up to now, Lord. Lord, indeed, as PW said, we're on a journey, and sometimes the journey takes a turn, and, and sometimes we're not ready. Our seatbelts are not buckled, and we're, we're tossed to one side, and we're afraid of being tossed out of the vehicle and landing on hard ground. And so, Lord, we want to steady our hearts and say, Lord, you are the bus driver, and we're going to just trust in you. 
And so, Lord, we want to be people who will glorify you by our attitudes, action, and words. But we want to honor you by our faith as well. That like Abraham, we would believe in you and be credited, that we would be credited of righteousness. That our faith would be strong enough to trust in the goodness, competence, wisdom, power, and the love of God. And so we want to behold the servant. We want to behold Hen, Abdi, behold my servant, and that servant, Father, is your son, Jesus. So we behold Jesus, our Lord, our shepherd, our pastor, our guide, our mighty leader. And we will follow where he leads us, simple as that. And we know that you lead us into green pastures, Lord. You don't lead us to death, but you lead us into life. And your heart beats for those who do not know you, those who are broken in their hearts, broken in relationship, broken in dreams and their bodies. And you want to touch, expand your kingdom and touch many. And so, Lord, we want to say yes to you. Be with all of us. Indeed, give us a sense of oneness that's focused on the one God, one you. That's you, Lord Jesus. Be with us. In Jesus' name, amen. According to Luke, when our risen Lord was at table with his disciples, he took the bread and blessed and broke it and gave it to them. Then their eyes were open and they recognized them. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Holy God, we praise you. Let the heavens be joyful and the earth be glad. We bless you for creating the whole world, for your promises to your people Israel, and for Jesus Christ in whom your fullness dwells. Born of Mary, he shares our life. Eating with sinners, he welcomes us. Guiding his children, he leads us. Visiting the sick, he heals us. Dying on the cross, he saves us. Risen from the dead, he gives new life. Living with you, he prays for us. With thanksgiving, we take this bread and this cup and proclaim the death and resurrection of our Lord. Receive our sacrifice of praise. Pour out your Holy Spirit upon us that this meal may be a communion in the body and blood of our Lord. Make us one with Christ and with all who share this feast. Unite us in faith. Encourage us with hope. Inspire us to love that we may serve as your faithful disciples, until we feast at your table in glory. We praise you, eternal God, through Christ, your word, made flesh, and the holy and life-giving spirit, now and forever. Amen. And now, with the confidence of the children of God, let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. The Lord Jesus, on the night of his arrest, took bread. And after giving thanks to God, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant sealed in my blood shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this in remembrance of me. Every time you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the saving death of the risen Lord until he comes. If I could have Elder Minju and Andrew come up and Pastor Tom. You're ready, you're welcome to the Lord's thing.